Samako and Salaf Jatra, you're watching a very special edition of Success. And uh, for weeks, we've talked about how our small, medium, and even micro enterprises, this is the backbone of our economy moving forward. This is the majority of entrepreneurs that we have. But the global platform is changing. The role of DFI or developmental financial institutions are also changing. I know um, Dr. Omar Razif has been with SME Bank for a long, long time. Now we'll get him to update us how he's still looking at the SME world. But uh, before that, I want to tap into his wisdom of uh, how do you galvanize the DFIs of this country to really spur one innovation, second, nurture them, keep then, thirdly, make sure that they move to the next level. So, Dr. Razif, the recent budget has given a lot of things for entrepreneurship, even for startups. VCs got special privileges mm. just to ensure that they put more money for entrepreneurship. But you have been doing this for a long, long time. Mm. You've seen Malaysia move from the last century to the new. You've seen the old economy to the new industrial revolution. So I'm just going to give you uh, the opportunity to paint the picture of where we are as far as the roles of DFI in helping entrepreneurship and also micro, small and medium because sometimes when I go down on the ground and you're the best person to put this in perspective, they told me that it's so hard to get financing. There's a lot of hurdles that they got to go through. They would rather sometimes use their own family's money rather than go to an institution whereby the irony is the government is pumping a lot of effort into DFIs mm -hmm. to help nurture micro, small and medium. Okay, thank you, uh, Cik Kamarul, for the invitation once again uh, for this supper program of success. I think, yeah, I think I am quite privileged in the sense that I think I've uh, taken care of my SME Bank for the last uh, seven years. And I think uh, on top of that, I've uh, been very much involved with regards to the cessation of uh, DFIs, not only within Malaysia, but also within the Asia-Pacific region, as well as the member Islamic countries of IDB. And I think lastly, uh, as probably all of you all would know, that I think we also got included into the Montreal group, which is basically a select group of DFIs. Uh, I think the bigger ones are basically the China Development Bank, as well as the uh, Canadian Development Bank. Now, going back to the issue in regards to uh, context of DFIs and DFIs role, um, you know, we're talking about this issue of financial inclusion. Uh, DFIs uh, definitely needs to stretch their arms a little bit wider to be able to actually capture the market that I think has not been captured to date. And this is where the context of what Venegara has always been trying to push, this context of financial inclusion. Uh, no doubt that I think one of the key things that I think DFI should be thinking about at this juncture is basically how to reform themselves to be more anti-cyclical i.e. Uh, not to go in when the financial institutions, all the private financial institutions are going in, but to come in when the financial institutions are not playing their role well okay. and for them to provide the support to the entrepreneurs. Okay. Uh, so that I think is actually a key element. I think World Bank has also stated in one of its statements that I think DFIs, without foregoing the context of good governance, without going through the context of prudence, you need to be playing a more anti-cyclical role. Uh, and to be able to actually provide the support to SMEs when SMEs requires the funding most. And this is actually the time. Uh, I mean, having been out of the bank and being able to actually interface with uh, some of the SMEs directly, you find that there are SMEs, good SMEs out there, who wants to expand their business outside the domestic market. They want to expand their business in the global market, for instance. And what more so with regards to this context of the digital free trade zone that has just been launched. You know, I mean, that is actually a, a, a way for us to be able to play in the global market. So financial institutions that they advise to actually extend uh, their financing in a different way uh, and to be able to actually assist. So the difference in terms of role that I think the advice have got to play, apart from the anti-cyclical role, is basically to be able to stretch out their arm in terms of going to this context of beyond financing. Yeah to provide the support to SMEs uh, by way of nurturing, by way of providing them with assistance where the assistance is required, by providing them with regards to market access. And the government has got many, many agencies that's involved regards to providing market access. Uh, international, for instance, you have the likes of Matrade. 
domestic, of course, you've got SME Corp. They can actually play a role in terms of fulfilling that, 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 that responsibility. So there's, there's, there's many ways that I think the FIS can actually play their role a bit differently as compared to what is the traditional way of providing just financing alone. Correct. Dato, new eras, new times, new ways, new challenges. Um, earlier in the year when I was in Davos, the World Comic Forum has a specific track just focusing on SMEs. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know they, they have yearly round approaches. And they're non-governmental, so they move faster and they network better globally. So I want to bring that experience back to Malaysia because our DFIs are very institutional. How would they move with the digital free trade zone when we can see that the first day it went operational, there's only nearly 2,000 mm -hmm. SMEs mm -hmm. only mm -hmm. that can migrate to the digital platform. Mm -hmm. But we have hundreds of thousands of SMEs. So how do we you know, scale up, widen the net Mm -hmm. so that this should become the mainstream rather than the alternative niche because if digital trade is digital niche for us then we are not leaping our SME to the new reality and the new reality is yeah. people are leaving brick and mortar to buy and purchase more and more online mm -hmm. well i think one of the one of the key things that i think one has got to start be look, start, start looking at is basically this this context of financial technology you know? Uh, this, uh, this advent of fintech coming in into the market. Yeah. This is actually uh, filling a gap. This actually is not being fulfilled by a lot of uh, financial institutions. Uh, you know, we're talking about microfinancing. You are talking about invoice trading. Yeah. Uh, you are talking with regards to blockchain uh, financing and so on and so forth. Uh, these are areas where I think the FI should embrace and to be able to actually move into these areas in a, in a, in a faster pace. Okay. Uh, that's one part of it. That's in the context of financing. But on the other hand, you know, you cannot provide all the support without the SMCs, SMEs also doing their part. Okay. Uh, and the scaling up has got to be one that has got to be driven by the SMCs, SMEs themselves. Mm -hmm. The businesses themselves have got to be the one that does the scaling up that, uh, you know, on, on their own accord. Yes. Uh, so the, the, the ability to actually meet up to the market, uh, you know, you have got to start thinking beyond the domestic market. Mm -hmm. That's a mindset shift in itself. Yes. Uh, so SMEs have got to start thinking you know, with all this advance, the government is actually providing infrastructure, if you like, the way the government is actually providing. SMEs have got to be able to embrace this okay. and to be able to change the mindset, to be able to fulfill the expected market in, in the future. Mm -hmm. Right, I have to go for the first break, Dato, but once we are back, I would like to quote Jack Ma in Sepang when he says that this is just the new beginning because WTO doesn't work for the small people. Uh, the GATT uh, agreement around the world doesn't work for the small people. He envisions an electronic world trading platform, EWTP, which DFTZ is part of it. And he says, this is just for the SMEs. Mm. You know, we have to go past, we've got to build our own network because the big boys won't allow us in. Mm. And the statistic by WEF and Oxfam where only eight families, business families of the world own half mm. of the world's population wealth. Mm. That's equal, 3.5. What Jack Ma is trying to lead into is that for new beginning, we need new ways and new platforms. How do we move this? Because even though we have DFIs for the longest time, SMB Bank, Agro Bank, but we've been used to the old economy. How do we migrate to the new? One of the best hybrid systems that we've done is having the GLCs and the GOCs to embark experiments, spearhead into new technical areas, new technological areas. I remember there's Petronas, but there's you know, smaller companies given the right to go into mining data, like uh, seismic, uh, seismic data uh, for, for the small Bermuda companies, for example. How do we do that now? Because maybe DFI has got to work together with other GLCs and GOCs to pave the way for certain areas because small and medium might not have the know-how and the guts and the network and the expertise to blaze the trail. That we'll discuss after the short break. Hi, you're still watching a very special edition of Success and this is just for you, entrepreneurs and small and medium enterprise, even micro ones. And uh, I was just uh, asking the wisdom of Dr. Razif to look at, uh, you know, the role, we can't run away for our SMEs because in Malaysia, wealth creation is not just a liberal, free, capitalistic initiative, but also a venture to reshape society, redistribute wealth 
or reorganize the way equation of wealth is given to us, uh, to a lot of people. So in that sense, you've talked about financial inclusion, but financial inclusion alone cannot stand off from the main bulk of wealth creation, yeah. which is now in the hands of the few, as we yeah. have seen the statistic. So digital economy gave us a new chance to start a new, a new supply chain that nobody has dominated, but to hope for small and medium to just spearhead that. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, Zeta, for example, is more than 10 to 16 countries, mm -hmm. and uh, so is Maybank mm -hmm. and uh, CIMB and stuff. Why can't we do more like China, where the moment one company blazes the trail, the others will follow. Yeah. The moment Alibaba helped Malaysia to form the first DFTZ outside China, mm -hmm. then they spearhead the SMB embarkation yeah. to yeah. platforms like the Malaysian DFTZ. Yeah. Well, I guess I guess talking of, uh, purely on the context of DFI's role and how they actually should play this role, given the new uh, e-digital uh, platform that I think Alibaba has I think, uh, proposed to the government and have established in the DFTZ. I think one has got to probably look at DFIs from a different context. Uh, you know, one of the key things I think that I think that's often discussed is this issue with regards to the DNAs of DFIs okay. and versus versus the DNAs of SMEs. Okay. That in itself, I think there's actually a disparity in terms of the mindset. Don't you? One is that I think for that development financial institutions being banks are uh, very much uh, a risk entity. Mm -hmm. They like to mitigate risk, they like to be able to look at risk in the right platform, they will only come in with regards to the money based on whatever risk assessment they have undertaken. Okay. But SMEs per se are basically very much risk takers. You know, they have got to start growing the business. Yeah. So the, the ability to actually seize an opportunity is the ability also to take on the risk. Mm -hmm. So this is where I think that gap is that it's not being captured at the moment. Uh, and that's the reason why I think you have the likes of uh, financial technology and you have this uh, digital platform that's actually been provided like, from, from the likes of Alibaba. I think it cuts across. You do not, you bring your products direct to the market. You need to do yeah. away with regards Correct. to middlemen, mm -hmm. right? So you have the ability to sell your products direct to the market per se. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think their advice have got to be able to actually look at it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a financing of the new generation, financing yeah. of the different needs of customers. So one has got to be, have the ability to actually look at it from a total different perspective per se. And how do you actually manage this element of risk, not from the traditional banking approach or managing yes. risk? Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that I think, I think a lot of the FIs now are conceiving. And of course, uh, sometimes uh, being a financial institution, you're subjected to international sets of regulations. Right. Uh, so that also becomes uh, a, a constraint, if I want to put it that way. You know? I mean, things like, for instance, financial reporting that needs to be put in, mm -hmm. you know? which uh, if you have the, the financial intermediaries like FinTech coming in, yep. They, they are not subjected to that kind of financial uh, uh, financial prudence yes. uh, and financial regulations. Mm -hmm. So, in a sense, they, they can come in and provide financing directly to the consumers yes. or to the SMEs in a different way altogether. Yeah. So, but does that mean that the FIs have got to be able to embrace the fintech? I think they've got to start working together mm -hmm. because you cannot change the DNA of the. What is the best platform for that to happen? I think collaboration. You have to collaborate with regards to the fintechs of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Alipay is a good example. Yes. All right, Alipay. Now the banks are coming in. CIMB has signed. MB Bank has signed with Alipay, mm -hmm. and CIMB is coming to the fore. These are areas that I think the banks have got to start changing the way that things are being undertaken. Because I think you and I, we do all our transactions on our handphones. Mm -hmm. We buy air tickets through our handphones. You know, we book hotels through our handphones. Right. So whatever payment that we make is actually direct through the phone. So you know, we don't go to the bank, you know, we draw the money and make payments to, a, you know, or do we actually check to our tra travel Correct. agent anymore. Yes. So the, the, the things have changed. Yeah. So financial institutions have always been like guards, yeah. I mean, to put it that way. And, yeah. and to be able to actually meet that requirement, you have to be able to start reinventing yourself. Yeah. To have a different set of mind, different mindset to be able to actually match up with regards to the expectations of the market out there. I thought, do, do, do we have to look at policy, new policies, and new regulation because I have not seen, maybe I'm naive, but I have not seen any DFI's role in great Malaysian companies of the new era like Grab, for example. And they have always gone for venture capital, uh, private capital's investment. But uh, if we go that way, not all founders have strong networks and family ties with big networks. Mm -hmm. If somebody is fresh out of college but having great ideas and great drive of entrepreneurship, how would he or she get value? Because in the new economy, 
they do not have collaterals. Yeah. Grab doesn't own a single car that it has service for. Airbnb doesn't have a single building or hotel that it owns. It uses somebody else. So in the traditional banking, I used to be <laughs> a banker myself. So they would ask, okay, you want to do a, a, a you know, a hospitality industry, where's your building? But if you ask that question now, it's, it's like no new technopreneurs and entrepreneurs would be going that way. So that collaboration that you talk about might need a sandbox. Right. Under the budget for 2018, there's now a regulatory sandbox given. So is this the kind of collaboration and experiment and testing and risk-taking management that you're talking about? Well, I think that's, that's something that I think our central bank has started with. I mean, they've already established this sandbox uh, for, for purposes of submission of any financial technology that comes into play. And uh, that one that actually has got a play in the open market. And I'm sure that I think is the, the intent. Uh, but if you look at some other countries, for instance, uh, I was told in Indonesia, for instance, uh, I mean, the context of sandboxing and going out to the market is, is it's parallel. Okay. So you can actually go out to the market in regards to your technology, mm -hmm. but at the same time, the regulators will actually look at it from the sandbox perspective. Okay. And, but if there are regulatory constraints, then definitely the, the regulators will come in and actually provide certain advice in terms of how you can actually make sure that you do not, you, you have to have strengthened uh, your compliance standards, for instance, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, ag again, I mean, th these are new new things, right? Yep. New things that's coming into the market. And I'm sure that not only the players have got to reinvent themselves, I'm sure the likes of all regulators themselves, be it uh, central bank or be it some other financial uh, financial uh, regulators, they have to be able to actually look at it from a different perspective. Yeah. The old and tried and tested way needs to yes, change God. to fulfill yes. uh, basically the new expectation of the new market. Mm -hmm. And I think Jack Ma says that very, very well because you know you have to be able to play the game in, in a different way Correct. because you want to be able to actually capture the market in a different way. So how do you do this if you don't actually change the ways that you've been doing traditionally? Mm -hmm. um, I have to go for the last break, but once we are back, you know, I've always wonder we talk about the availability of fund but uh, if we look at the islamic market we have wakaf and we have zakat for example that can be a great source of funding for the community social entrepreneurship for example doesn't wait for any regulatory financial institution or uh, institution like Bank Negara and it moves and it merged together with crowdfunding and crowdsourcing and it moves so this is the new way and the fact that we are the biggest initiator and still manager of financing like Sukuk for example shouldn't we combine all this and make for something new for the world that's the question I want to ask about this last break and let's talk about that after this short break You are still watching Success and this is a special edition. SE or Social Entrepreneurship, Social Enterprises. It seems to be more uh, popular to this side of the world because of the social imperative ingrained into wealth creation. But uh, would DFI see and audit? Would there be an Accenture or ACCA for the social side of entrepreneurship? Would Bursa suddenly have another counter for the social side? So these are the questions I'm thinking aloud because SME per se wouldn't be looking at the macro picture. But you, Dato, is your great wisdom. Can you enlighten us on that? Well, I think, Kamarul, I think one, one has got to accept the fact that uh, you know, we're talking about an ever-evolving environment. Uh, I think let's, let's start with regards to the, the realisation on the part of the government. I think the government has also recognized the fact that this is where the evolution is going to take place. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why the event of Industrial Revolution uh, 4.0 has come into play. And then, of course, with that, then you have the, DGT, uh, the, the digital free trade zone. Now, I think along the way, and I'm sure you know, people that is within the ecosystem, the likes of SME Corp, the likes of Central Bank, the likes of all other institutions, are actually trying to mirror. Mm -hmm. But it's a question of speed. Yeah. It's a question of speed of trying to get yourself to be adjusted towards what the market actually requires. Because on this end, the market is moving at a very, very fast pace. Yes. Right? Well, on this end, because we are behemoth organizations, you know, you have got to be able not to change the system from within. You've yeah. got to change the system from outside also. Okay. Okay? Uh, the regulatory standards need to be put in place. The banks have got to change their own systems mm -hmm. to be able to mirror the expectations of the market so that they, they do not take unnecessary risk. Mm -hmm. 
So this is where I think uh, you know there must be some form of realization that if the market is moving at that fast pace, then definitely all things in coming in support has got to mirror that that expected requirement. So that at yeah. least you, then you can fulfill the market needs as Correct. and when. Mm -hmm. If not, if not, then you run the risk of being totally obsolete. Okay. Right. Uh, there's a there's a caption that says that I mean the event of financial technology will see the death of financial institutions, banks. Correct. Right? That's the uh, worst case scenario. Uh, yeah. That's the worst case scenario. Yeah. So what these financial technologies are actually providing is basically a stopgap measure. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure uh, that I think once the financial institutions, the FIs, be it, you know, start to embrace and start to work in collaboration with regards to a lot of these things, I think the, the, the market will come back to a point of normalization. Okay. And that's when I think, you know, I think everything will be back to uh, we're providing the right kind of support to the right set of industries, the right kind of customers, to the right set of SMEs. But the speed needs to be there. So that's one part of it. Yes. The other part of it is basically the SMEs themselves. Yes. You know, if you do not actually scale up, mm -hmm. you do not take the advantage in regards to what the DFIs have done. I mean, case in point, basically, as this program is called success. Yes. They've actually built up the so-called numbers in terms of successful entrepreneurs over time. Yeah. But, you know, scaling up to be able to fulfill the domestic market in itself is not the name of the game these days. Okay. You know, you've got to be able to actually be part of the digital free trade zone, for instance. Okay. How can yeah. you actually bring your products to the open market, for instance? Correct. How fast can you go to the open market, mm -hmm. for instance? I mean, these are issues that only none can actually change. Government can actually provide the platform. Yes. But the players themselves mm -hmm. need to be able to embrace it and to change their mindset. A lot of what we said Dato, now goes back to the human factor. Yeah. Talent is key now, uh, talking about it. I mean, I've also spoken, and Astro Awani has spoken to many uh, traditional bank leadership uh, members. And uh, we're talking about six to 7,000 staff who used to be from the flan front line clerical right up until the officers, the current account officers, the seven account officers, as in the traditional days, and then there you have the FDE and whatever not. So all this now are bypass. So there are numbers of people that will not be able to migrate fast enough. Mm -hmm. So, but rather than see that as a block, we can see that as a future talent that can go into the new environment and system. Mm -hmm. So with that, I want to ask you this question. If the leaders are mainly still, from the finance and banking and the accounting background, who has not done a single day of entrepreneurship. This is why the SMBs keep saying that the institution doesn't understand them. It's not maybe the institution per se, but the different paradigm where they know the leadership is looking from the basis where they are trained. And like you said, risk managers versus risk takers. So, maybe the country needs a new platform beside the regulatory sandbox for where the corroborative aspects need to be there. We're not asking for 10%, maybe even 1% or 2% of focus for Malaysia that might bring. You know, couples told me that if they invest 10 companies in Malaysia, they're just looking at one to be successful. Can DA5 move towards that? Not for the entire basket that they have, but for just one basket from the many to park our interest there? Well, the answer to that question is, uh, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, I think we're going to be pushed towards that direction uh, rather than advance towards that direction. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't move, then you run the risk of being totally obsolete. Yeah. So I, I would have thought that given the current circumstances, I mean, I, I, let me quote you an example of what's sure. happening in Indonesia, for instance, mm -hmm. you know. And you have a platform uh, that goes out to the market, you know, that, that sells just purely invoices. Mm -hmm. You know, what they do is basically, they, they take in customers. Uh, these are a group of ex-bankers. They take in customers uh, who have got invoices that they want to trade. Okay. All right. What they do then, they actually put that invoices on the platform. But of course, okay. at the back end, they will do the assessment in terms of how yes. good the invoices is, or how good the paymasters okay. are, you know, uh, how good is the, the borrower themselves. They put that into the platform and then people will bid mm -hmm. uh, to get into to actually bid for that, that invoice. So okay. instead of one invoice, you know, you can get probably three or four people who want to actually take because mm -hmm. the safety of payment. Yeah. So what's going to stop all these things coming into mm -hmm. the fore later mm -hmm. on? Mm -hmm. I mean, why do we need to go to the factoring houses anymore? Yeah. Why do we need to go to the banks to get working capital? Mm -hmm. uh, why do we need to actually, you know, I mean, dulu we used to go to go to a travel agent to yes. get an airline mm -hmm. ticket. Now we don't need to go to an airline uh, travel okay. agent to get an airline okay. ticket. 
So then there is a need to reinvent. I mean, I, 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 I think talent, talking about issues of talent, uh, there's going to be a shift of talent. Mm -hmm. Data scientists are going to be something that is going to be more demanded. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, of course, data scientists with uh, financial background will be best because they would understand both ends. Yes. Uh, so these are things that I think would evolve over time. And I guess uh, banks uh, will be pushed in that direction, uh, the FIs more so. And the FIs have got to play, uh, to me, the FIs have got to play the, the leadership role. Why? Because of the anti-cyclical thing. Okay. Uh, you need to be able to come in when others have not come in. You need to be paved the way because that's what a uh, dev development financial institution is. They are right. instruments of government. Yes. So instruments of government need to be able to pave the way to fulfill what government wants them to do. Yes. And that's the mandate. Correct. Thank you so much, Dato. And you heard it here first. Uh, this is a show that Awani works together with SME Bank and we talk about top leadership here and Datuk Razif has put down uh, the mantle there then that's the benchmark to follow. Thank you so much Datuk for making yeah. time. Thank you. Thanks to you for watching. Terima kasih banyak telah menonton dan tekan pandangan anda sendiri kepada pelbagai platform yang ada di Esra Wani dan kita jumpa lagi dalam sukses minggu depan. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.